Welcome to another live episode of the Wisco Fanatic Show, where we discuss the Packers, Bucks, Brewers, Badgers football, and basketball from an optimistic perspective. Wisco Fanatics is brought to you by Cardboard Legacy, Wisconsin's most complete sports card shop. Buy, sell, grade, and consign all at their location in Oshkosh. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another Wisco Fanatics Wednesday. Uh, I have to deal with me being a little nasally today. I've been a little under the weather the last couple days, but... I am here, so we got that going for us. But uh, we got five Brewers games and four Milwaukee Bucks games to discuss this week. And because of some of the contextual things going on with the Bucks, we are actually going to start with the Brewers today, even though the Bucks are closer to their postseason than the Brewers are. So we're going to switch that up a little bit today, and we are going to start with the Brewers. So we're going to go to the Brewers versus Mariners series. And game one against the Mariners, uh, Jake, What's that out to you from that one? All right. So, first thing I got to say, um, bro, we haven't done a show together in how many weeks? Two weeks. Uh, two, two, well, this would be the third week, right? Because two weeks ago you missed. Last week I missed because of the snowstorm. So then this week would make three weeks. Did we have the Friday together that week, though? We did. I mean, Wednesday show, I guess. We haven't done so, a regular Wednesday show together. So, in three weeks, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a been an adventure. Life has been, uh, yeah, <laughs> been pretty crazy, man. It's been throwing a lot of stuff at us, but you know, perseverance. Um, I'm using this as a transition when we get to the Bucks later because you know that's that's the word of the day today. As some people don't know how to handle it, and uh, that's just a little foreshadowing for you. Uh, for something I might talk about later. Uh, But right now we're going to talk about the Brewers and Mariners, the first game, right? Uh, Freddie Peralta on the mound gave us five and a third, four hits, three earned runs, one walk, and seven Ks. So, I mean, what more can you ask for? He's our ace. He goes out there. He acts like it every time he's on the mound. Uh, Yelly, Adamas, Contreras, Ortiz, and Dunn. That is five people contributing to the runs. Uh, That's fantastic. Uh, two, Two of those... Those RBIs were with two outs, Ortiz and Dunn. Dunn has been nothing but fantastic and a pleasant surprise. Um, during our Brewers primer, we asked the question, who's the guy that could step up like uh, an Andrew Monasterio, right? And I think that question has been answered early in this season. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dunn has been fantastic. Yelly, Adamas, and Dunn have home runs, had home runs. Frelick and Dunn with stolen bases. Dunn had his <laughs> – he got it done in this game. I'm just going to say that. Um, the <clears throat> the bullpen was fantastic, in my opinion. I mean, Uribe gave up a couple of runs, but he's young. He's going to have his ups and downs, ebbs and flows, right? We talk about that quite a bit, especially during the baseball season. So, with that being said, I mean, the Brewers had eight hits, had nine Ks. So, again, I'm watching that this season. That's something I'm going to really uh, see if that, that correlates to success – Um, I will say the thing that I took away most from this game, the thing that was most encouraging for me is every, the Brewers got ahead in this game, uh, got an early lead three, zero, I believe it was. And the Mariners came back to tie it at three. When the Mariners scored, the Brewers immediately scored, responded with a run of their own, taking the lead back. And I think scoring throughout the game, they scored in the second, the fourth, the sixth, the eighth and the ninth scoring in all different innings all over the game. That's a very encouraging thing to see for this Brewers offense compared to last year. And I know we don't really like to do those kind of comparisons because it's a completely different team, right? But when you look at it, it's still early in the season. So those comparisons are just human nature, right? So for me, uh, them scoring in a bunch of innings, responding every time the Mariners tried to try to take the lead or they tied it. I think that's, that speaks volumes, honestly. Yeah, my dad said, go Brewers, he's about to go on whatnot. My dad's doing some whatnot card sales for uh, for Black Gold Sports Cards. He's having fun with that. Oh, nice. um, I might check that out when the show's done. But for me, looking at a few things, the Brewers and Mariners both had three one two three innings apiece. Uh, yeah. And then you mentioned the nine strikeouts. That is my sweet spot. So when mm-hmm. I'm looking at the Brewers striking out, nine or less, I'm happy. If I'm If we're between like nine and 12, it's like, okay, like to get it down. And if we're over 12 strikeouts, that's that's too much. Yeah, I agree. So looking at the second inning approach, uh, Willie Adamas had an opposite field home run. 
Joey Ortiz had an opposite field double, and even the flyout that Bryce Terang had was to the opposite field. So the Brewers are doing a really good job with their approach at the plate, just taking what pitchers are giving them and just going with the pitch. Um, that's something we obviously know that William Contreras and Christian Yelich are both very good at. And then Christian Yelich, <laughs> the home run that he hit, 431 feet, 112.4 miles an hour off the bat. He knew it. He knew it was gone. He stood and watched it, kicked a foot up, and watched it fly. Yeah, he absolutely crushed that baseball, dude. He got all of that. That was Yelich putting all of him into that baseball. So yeah, that yeah, that was a that was a launched. Uh, to to Logan Gilbert's credit, uh, he is a pretty good pitcher. He pitched five and two thirds, gave up five hits, four earned runs. The Brewers did a good job against a good pitcher. That is that is a good job by the Brewers there. Brett said, first, I want to show my gratitude to you guys. Best and most positive Wisconsin sports talk. And also my friends, too. Also, hoping for Giannis's healing and some Buck stuff. I'm going to save the rest of that comment for later when we get to the Bucks, Brett. Um, but thank you for the kind words on the best and most positive Wisconsin sports show. Because that's what we I do. like that. Okay. You try. So, I want to bring up Bryce Terang. He didn't have any hits in this game, but I did like the way he approached um his at bats at the plate going with the pitch hitting the ball hard drawing a walk in the ninth inning um just his his plate discipline has really impressed me so far this year and i actually just made a reel about it in one of my play breakdowns that i did from the brewers game last night about bryce terang's uh chase percentages and contact Mm -hmm. um so if you're interested you can check that out that's on the page too um (laughs) appreciate it brett okay Freddie Peralta, you did mention him. He pitched really well. He gave up the three runs, but he threw some really, really nasty pitches. Freddie Peralta absolutely is the ace of this staff. And Brian Hudson is a guy who's pitching really well. I actually really like what Brian Hudson is bringing to the team so far this year. And Elvis Paguero was another guy that needs to have some credit given to him. He threw some absolute dots on the corners of the strike zone. Dude, he's he is very underrated by Brewers fans, in my opinion. I agree. He had a couple he's- tough – he had like one or two tough stretches last year. Obviously, he was young and we just, it was his first year. But man, for the most part, man, he's been pretty much locked down. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, and then Abner Uribe on the bullpen part of it, he did struggle through the ninth inning. He was able to get through it, and I think it's an experience that'll sharpen him. You know, yep. went through some rough times that'll so that'll get you through it. Um, and then Michael, if you're watching, last week Michael was the first one to bring up the point about. And he, like I said last week, he didn't do it in a way where it was like, oh, why are the Brewers getting all these guys on base just to not have anybody that can hit him in? Which is what I was expecting to get from Brewers fans. He was just saying, if the Brewers are getting guys on base, are we worried that they're not scoring runs? This is the point that I made last week. If you have guys that get on base, eventually you will run out of bases to put guys. And the Brewers drew four walks to score the game-winning run. And in the middle of that, there was a Jackson Churio strikeout. And I think the pitch that he struck out on is going to be a learning experience from him. So, yeah. and they brought it up during the broadcast that maybe he was looking for an off speed pitch and not a hundred mile an hour pitch. That was pretty, pretty fairly well inside the strike zone. Mm-hmm. Um, when he, you know, he'll learn from that, that that's just a pitch. If you don't get the pitch you're looking for, you just shorten your swing, make a defensive swing and follow that pitch off. Yeah. I live to fight another pitch, man. And- yeah. Those are things that he's going to have to learn. I mean, obviously, he's 20 years old, 20, 21 years old. So he's got a lot of learning to do in a short amount of time, and people have some very lofty expectations for him. So let's just temper those for now for the first couple of months until he gets comfortable. Yeah, and I'm not – like I said, I'm not going to say that it's, you know, Jackson Churio is not the guy because he struck out in that situation. Like I said, I think it's just going to be a learning experience for him. Um Brett said he loves Yelich's energy. Truly believe he's going to have an amazing year. So do we. We've been saying that since the All-Star break last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Churio's going to have learning experience, and you think he has a huge chance at Rookie of the Year? I think so. As far as the National League is concerned, he's the front runner right now. Yeah, he is. He's number one. They just came out with a list. I mean, I, I know it's like two weeks into the season, but right. I mean, I expect him to be one or two or maybe three, maybe three uh, for the entire year if he has a, a slouch, but I mean, the dog days of summer are going to get all these guys, but Churio's just so damn talented, man. And, you know, 
We've had uh, Javik Blake on here a few times, uh, interviewed him a few times. Tyler got to meet him down uh, when he went, went down to Biloxi. So, I mean, everything that we've heard about him, there's no reason to doubt his talent. So, yeah. And as, like, like Jake said, it's two weeks in. So, I'm not yeah. going to go as far as to say that the eight year deal is a steal looking at two weeks, but so far the early returns are very encouraging. I agree. So, Jake, what's up with you in the second game against the, the Mariners? I was actually at that game. Yes, yes, you were. And you got yourself a nice Giannis jersey that I got to say, dude, I got to say, why do we do this? And I don't mean we as in Wisco Fanatics or anybody in the comment section right now. I mean we as in like a general statement. Why do we go to games to get stuff that we know people want and then sell it online for a higher price? Why are we doing that? Just trying to make money? No, that's annoying. If I, I wanted I that, but that's the, that's the name of the, the game jersey, and a lot of things in life. If I wanted the jersey, I would have just went to the damn game. I'm not going to pay $115 for the damn jersey. I just think that's so just, yeah, somebody was trying to sell it for $115. I saw people selling them for like $35, and it's like, okay, like I could see that. No, I saw like, I saw like, I mean, I saw some 30s and 40s, but I saw like 85, a 115. I'm like, bro, what are we doing? Maybe like, if it was autographed. Yeah, I, like, Michael said he loves the start to the season. The hitting's been better than expected. Pitching, honestly, been what I've expected. What's the Tyler and Jake take? Um, hitting, it's been kind of like to the more optimistic point of where we thought it could be. Mm -hmm. Pitching, um, kind of a slow start, but not super far off of what we expected. Um, but Jake and I have the patience to to deal with getting through a slow start to get where we think they can be. Um, and Steve said, good point on the early returns. People wanted to bail on Sal a week ago. It's baseball. I know. Well, I know. Well, I had to tell people that so we were eight games in and people are like DFA, Gary Sanchez and, and send <laughs> Sal to triple a. It's like, we are eight games in to a 162 game season. You are talking about 5% of the season being over. I'm just going to say, I, I'm going to be very blunt in this episode. I'm just going to tell you that right now. If patience is one of your weak points, do not watch baseball. You are not going to like it. It's not for you. Just straight up. Like, and that's fine. No, you don't have to like baseball. But if you're if you don't want to watch the games and you're looking for recaps and you're looking for a better way to enjoy baseball, basketball, and football, welcome. Come here. We got you. Okay. But Honest to God, if you do not have the patience to sit through a guy going one for 11 for a week, like a week straight, don't watch baseball. You're going to hate yeah. it. You I'm going to have some stuff it. on Sal when we get into the Reds series. So I'm just going to answer Michael's real quick. The hitting, I agree with Tyler. It's been way better than I expected, especially early on. I, I did think that they had the talent. They added a little bit that they were going to be better than they were last year. And the pitching, I mean, given the injuries we have, we have had to deal with, um, I mean, Ashby having his first start in this last week, I mean, he pitched way better than I thought he was going to, honestly. We'll get out. there. Settle down. But I know, I know. I'm not going to go too crazy into it. But honestly, with everything we've had to deal with, I'm happy with it, honestly. Yeah, 7-3 yeah. and three oh. in 10 games. Yeah, I, I can't complain. If they go 7-3 and three every 10 games, we're going to be pretty good. Just going to say that right now. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Game two, besides people selling jerseys, what's that out to you? I mean, D.L. Hall, I mean, you could tell. You could tell everything that they were saying that he has the stuff, right? He does. He has good stuff. Yep. And he's going to be very good eventually. Yep. And he's had some, he's had some rough innings where he's, get, he's gotten hit around a little bit, some control issues from time to time. But he's going to be freaking good, dude. I think the Brewers, I mean, and – Again, we're going to get into the Red Series. Nortiz had a, had a rough day in the first game of the Red Series. But I really think the Brewers got an absolute home run hit with, with the return they got for Corbin Burns. When you think about the possibilities of him just walking away for free, you get mm -hmm. a guy like a D.L. Hall who absolutely has the stuff. He's going to be a dealer. And Ortiz, I like him so far, man. He's, he's showing that he can handle himself yep. as a professional baseball player. And this is a really good locker room clubhouse, sorry, for him to be in. Um, I, I think the Brewers hit it out of the park. Uh, Deal Hall, he's going to be a good one. Uh, right, uh, right. I always say that. Reese Hoskins, I apologize. He's going to be the name I mess up this year. So, welcome. 
Uh, he had a sack fly, so he he's run producing as he was he was signed to do. Just want to say that as a foreshadow right now. Yeah. Um, Terrio had uh, two RBIs. I mean, we tried to come back in the eighth inning. Uh, I forgot the pitcher's name for the Mariners, but he was good for seven innings. He was very good. Oh, There's Bryce three. Miller. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, he was, was really good. He was dealing. Um, and you know what? That That's part of sports that we've talked about as well is the other team is trying to win too. So yeah. just so everybody understands that, like both teams like come to the game, they're like, we're going to win. So when we lose, I mean, it happens. Okay. It's, yeah. it's fine. You can, you can give credit to your opponents when they, when they play well. Yeah. He, he was balling, dude. He was, he was hitting corners. He was, he was, you know, mixing up pitches. He was doing a great job. He had a great Soft game. So shout out to him. Brewers, Brewers were 0 for 4. Didn't really have many opportunities or runners in scoring position. And, and that that's another, you know, credit to them as well because they they held us off the base pads and they really controlled things. And the Brewers, the, the thing about this is the Brewers came out swinging early. They were trying mm -hmm. to attack right away. And when they weren't getting the results they were, I mean, we flew it on the first pitch, I believe, first pitch or second pitch. Um, that was a long time ago now, so my brain doesn't remember. <laughs> but – they were trying to be aggressive early. I remember that the first and second innings, we were really trying to get after it. And then they tried to do a more patient approach and he was really hammering the strike zone with first pitch strikes and putting us behind in counts. And that's hard for the offense to adjust to. So you tried to, you tried to attack him by being aggressive. Then you tried to lay back and he's, he's being aggressive and taking matters into his own hands. So, I mean, it was just a good game for them. Uh, I, love that the Brewers don't give up and they play nine innings of baseball. And this team is going to be a hell of a lot of fun for 162. I'm going to say that. Absolutely. So on your point about DL Hall, mm -hmm. I don't think he pitched poorly, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, he threw some nice pitches. His fastball changeup slider combo is going to be really good for the Brewers. I agree with you on that. Um, overall, to pitch five and a third innings and give up three earned runs isn't bad. And now, again, his previous outing of four innings was his longest career outing. Now, five and a third is his longest career outing. So, patience with D.L. Hall is going to be necessary. He's not going to be giving the Brewers seven innings all the time right out of the gate of the season. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk about that third inning because it was kind of like a 1,000 cuts situation. Some not great defense and some soft contact. The first hit was a bunt. Bowers and Hall both charged it, and by the time somebody got to the ball – Nobody was able to get to first base fast enough. That's just – it's smart hitting, to be honest with you, is what it is. It's a fast player knowing that if he can get the ball to a spot where everybody's going to go for the ball and not the base, that he's going to get a hit. Mm -hmm. That's just smart hitting. Mm -hmm. um, and then a pass ball, let him get to second base. And then a scorching 67.3 mile-an-hour exit velocity single into center field gave up the first run. That's baseball, man. That's exactly it. It's like what? that's soft contact. That's there's nothing you can do about it. What's that thing? What's that thing we were doing last year? That's baseball. baseball. <laughs> so after that, there was a single that was up the middle, and from my point of view, I was kind of behind home plate a little bit to the first base side. It looked like Adamas and Terang both started to go for it, and then it looked like they both thought the other was going to go for it, and then neither of them ended up going for it. Mm -hmm. So just kind of an unfortunate situation there. And then there was another really slow ground ball at 62.5 miles an hour exit velocity to third base. That was slow enough that they weren't able to turn a double play. Hmm. Um, bloop and a blast is the saying, Steve. Yep. Um, so after that, they couldn't turn the double play. That made the game two to zero. And then there was a hard hit single. And then after that, 97-mile-an-hour uh, exit velocity ground ball that bounced off of Oliver Dunn's glove into left field. Mm. That's that's tough. I mean, we, you don't fault effort, and that's uh, another foreshadowing to something we'll talk about in the Red Series. But um, after that, they were able mm. to get a double play and get out of the inning. So, like I said, I don't think Bright or D.L. Hall pitched poorly. Um, just a little bit of bad luck and a little bit of the baseball gods favoring the Mariners a little. It happens. Yeah, that said, you already mentioned Bryce Miller and a really good job of pointing out how he was able to be effective. Uh, the Brewers struck out eight times. I will take that. Uh, they had four, one, two, three innings. That's not great. And the Mariners only had two. Um, so that obviously factored in. 
Tarang and Churio were able to f- manufacture the first runs of the game, and Churio with this game was tied with Hoskins for second on the team in home runs at two. So, um, you know, things change, but good job for Churio to be, again, just early in the season in those conversations. Mm-hmm. So the Brewers, they did uh, rebound majorly in game three. So what stood out to you from game three? Um, Wow. Wow. They they just exploded at the plate. Um, just want to talk real quick about Contreras, who had five RBIs in the day, getting off to eight on the season. Um, this was his fourth career multi-home run game. He had two home runs in this game. And it's his first with the Brewers. So first multi-home run game, fourth of his career. And uh, exiting this game, Contreras was second in all of MLB at average exit velocity on his hits at 99.5 miles per hour. You want to know what what his his exit velocities in this game were? Well, tell me. Just for this game, his four hits, 105.3, 104.2, 104.5, 105.0. That will raise the average. That'll raise the average. That will raise the average. Yeah, he was smashing the ball. Um, he actually went something like 7 of 12 in the series, and the Mariners' skip was actually talking about it after the game, and he was like – he didn't even call him Contreras. He just said the Brewers catcher. He said the Brewers catcher had a great series. We didn't do anything to stop him all series. So, I mean, if if you want to talk about getting respect, I mean, hearing it from the other team's manager, that's – that's like the highest form of respect in right. any sport, honestly. Yeah. Um, but in this game, seven players, including Contreras, had RBIs. Frelick had a two-out RBI. Um, Bowers had his first. Terang up to three. Frelick had his first two. Churio is up to seven. Dunn is up to four. And Adamas is up to four. Adamas also homered in this game. Um I mean, the Brewers were 7-14 of or runners in scoring position. Bowers had a steal. Terang had a steal. Dunn had a steal. They were doing everything. And on top of all that, Colin Ray just continues to do yeah. what Colin Ray does, dude. And he's another guy. Can we stop disrespecting him? Fucking this guy a, is dude. not a superstar. He's not paid like a superstar. He's not expected to be a superstar. That goddamn guy goes out there and gives us six innings. And gives that, us a dude is a, win. that dude is a sturdy stud. He gives us six innings, six of nine. He, he yep. gives you six of the nine innings, and he gives you a chance. I talked it, about it at the end of 2023 that over the course of the season, I think he made like 22 starts last year, and 19 of them, he gave up like four or fewer runs. I don't know that that's the exact stat, but it's really close to something like that, yeah. that any time that Colin Ray pitches, you are not going to be outside of striking distance or in the lead. When he leaves the game, yeah, he he's not going to leave a game, and you're going to be like, oh, okay, you know, we got a lot of work to do. Like, if Colin Ray is pitching, you know, you're going to have a chance to win through the first six innings. That and that's that's the oh my god, I can't wait till we get to a certain segment, bro. I am going to freaking let loose. I'm just going to tell you. I that have right Colin now. Ray in my notes that Brewers fans really need to give him his respect for how but, solid he was last year. A good start to he's off to this year. Yeah, and doing a really good job of staying on the edges of the strike zone. But seriously, dude, what I mean, what do people expect? Honestly, like we have to start. You have to start doing some some real, you know, self, you know, realization of what you're expecting of these people. They're human beings, and yeah. for Colin Ray to come literally out of nowhere and not, yes, we know him out of now. Japan. He, yeah, he was with us last year, and we know him now. But to come out of nowhere, Japan, as Tyler said, I mean. He's fantastic, dude. Honestly, yeah. for the, really, for the really level solid. that he's paid at, fantastic. So I couldn't have been happier with this game. This game was awesome. Uh, shout out to Vieira as well. Uh, three inning save. So good for him. Um, you could tell at the end he was getting kind of gassed. I believe he threw like fifty or fifty-one pitches. So he just wanted this son of a bitch to be over at the end, man. He was like, "All right, this is uh, this is a lot. Of, my arm is dead right now, but." You know, shout out to him for saving the bullpen for another day. So, yeah, good yep. job by him and the offense, man, on fire. Yeah. Now, I saw right away in this game, of course, too, people can't wait to say something until the game is over. <laughs> Sal Freelich makes an error in the first inning, and people are like, oh, my God, here's Sal with a terrible defense. Of course, it was on a yep. day that Yelich is off, which Yelich is going to get a couple days off this year, especially in the middle of a 13-game stretch where they're playing mm-hmm. 13 straight games. 
Mm-hmm. You mentioned South Felix two RBI. They literally came with two outs in the bottom of the first inning. They did. He drove in two runs with two outs the inning after making an error that led to one run. So he already made up for the error and an extra run. Yeah. So just put that to bed. Just leave it alone. But no, you, you know, people at the top of the first inning of a baseball game right away got to be like, oh, sail free. Like, mm-hmm. Couldn't even wait till they got up the bat? Apparently not. No. Okay. With Colin Ray, my thing with him staying on the edges of the strike zone, if Colin Ray can locate his curveball for strikes, he is going to be great for the Brewers this year. Good. He will get into not, again, probably not. He's not going to be a superstar. I don't have to say probably with that. Probably not going to be a star, but he is going to be one of those guys where you look at at the end of the year and it's like, wow, that guy had like a 3.5 ERA. That's actually really solid for a guy who's your number three starter. Colin Ray is really like, seriously, he's like a corner of your house. Like he will hold up your foundation. He is that reliable. That was that was almost Bobby Goldfish like, <laughs> but that was pretty good. Give me credit for that one. Colin, yeah, Colin Ray is a really sturdy piece of the Brewers' starting pitching rotation. He really is super reliable. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time through the Brewers' order, their first nine batters, they had six hits. Wow. So that's great to see. I gave you William Contreras' exit velocities. I'm glad you brought up uh, Tiago Vieira saving the bullpen. Bryce Durang, more crazy defense. Um, he had a single, an RBI, stolen base, drew a walk. And you mentioned the stolen bases. The Brewers had three steals for the fourth time this season <laughs> through this game. It took the Brewers until their 61st game in 2023 to have four games with three plus stolen bases. No way. (laughs) They did it in 2024 and eight. (laughs) That's wild, bro. Wow. I like that. So basically 50% of their games through the first four games of the season, they had three plus stolen bases. You know, what's really weird is like being more aggressive on the base pads and like, you know, be having a better approach at the plate and the offense is just like, you know, good. So, I mean, and, and just, you know, getting on base. So, yeah, there's that, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's wild. Let's, let's go to last night's – not last night, two nights ago, Monday's game against the Reds, game one. What's up to you from game one against the Reds? All right. I got to start by saying it. Ellie De La Cruz is, like, good at baseball, okay? So, I don't know why I need to explain this, but I'm just going to defend Frelick – and I know that you're going to say the same thing. I completely agree with what he did. Yep. I know there was a lot of people that are like, why wouldn't you just let the ball drop and then let it hold it to a single? Okay. Do you remember that this is the same guy that stole three bases on us? Do you know that if he gets yep. on first, he's probably stealing second base anyways? See if you can if you can find where I have it written right Right he oops. You, could you see what I had written there? Are you stealing? Nope. Right. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. We don't fault effort. No. Never. Well, I got you know, in so <clears throat> let me reset. Pat Murphy said it really well after the yep. game. And he said that. You know, he agrees with it as well, and he understands what Frelick was trying to do. And I agree 100%. When I saw that, I thought that immediately. I was like, you know what? You're trying to steal a hit from a guy that if he gets on base, he's dangerous anyways. And your your pitcher on the mound, Ashby, is in his first game in like 13, 14 months. So, I mean, it's you got to try to help your pitcher out, and I respect that. I honestly do. Um. The offense for the for the Reds started out on fire. They were going crazy. And I got to tell you, L.A. De La Cruz couldn't have had two completely different home runs in this game. I mean, my God. He absolutely shotguns one <laughs> out of the stadium damn near. And, then, you know, just a funky play that, 
if he doesn't have all that speed, he's not going to score. But that's just the risk that he you... barely almost scored anyways. If Willie Donis's throw doesn't hit the mound, he might have been out at the plate. Yeah, true. I mean, you know, it is what it is. Um, but we had some good things come out of this game. Mm-hmm. Um, every player that played in this game had a hit except Willie Adamas. So almost everybody got a hit in the lineup. We had four players that had two hits. Uh, Contreras, Terang, Frelick, and Ortiz. So, I mean, that's a great output. Um, we knew that Yelich was going to hit a home run because he's playing at a great American ballpark. So that was just a given. Uh, you go into games against the Reds and get great American ballpark, you're like, all right, so we got at least one. We have at least one because right. Yelich didn't home run. <laughs> um, but, but, you know. Cycle against us again. Yeah, right. It, it's going to happen tonight, probably. Right. <laughs> but I got to say, Aaron Ashby, man, uh, three and a third, six hits, four earned, two Ks, and two walks. Now, you look at that from afar, and if you didn't watch the game and understand the game, you're like, ew, gross. But if you understand the severity of his injury, he had surgery, first start back. I mean, this is Major League Baseball. These these guys are freaking good, man. Um. I love how Ashby looked, honestly. His arm angle, his delivery, he was fantastic. In I my think opinion. he looked good. That gave me a lot of optimism that, you know, two months from now, he's going to be a guy that's going six innings, maybe maybe six and a third with, with how Murphy allows these guys to go, right? He he lets them go a little bit longer than Council did. And, you know, he could be fanning eight guys. He just – he has that stuff, right? So when yep. he gets that control, that, that command back, I think the pitching staff is going to be fine, honestly. I agree That's with you. Honestly, the least of my worries. Um, and the guy that he's pitching in place of, Jacob Junis, I think he's pretty solid too. <laughs> yeah, I have no complaints about him as well. Um, but, you know, the offense showed up. We had 12 hits, uh, 11 strikeouts, so uh, another positive in that in that regard. Uh, scored three runs in the fifth, three runs in the sixth, two runs in the seventh. So put up some big innings late in this game to make a comeback. And honestly – after a loss, I couldn't have felt better with how this team fought. I, I love this team. I compared them to the Packers and our primer, and I really have that feel. They're they're going to do some shit that you're just like, that's a head scratcher. Don't know why you did that. But then they're going to do some stuff where they're just like, holy crap, the potential of this offense is insanity, right? So I'm happy. I'm good, man, honestly, yeah. even after a loss. You know what? The Reds. The Reds wanted one against us, so we, we nobody's going one. 162 and all either. So if your if yeah. your expectation is to win every single game, you're going to be unhappy. Agreed. Um, Michael said, "I love the aggressive approach on the base pads. One, we have the speed, and two, it's more pressure put on the opposition, which is true." Uh, he said, "Which again leads to more runs." Uh, I just love our manager and his post game comments too. And yeah, Pat Murphy, I love Pat Murphy. Bro, he's a thug, bro, straight up. <laughs> he's a thug. He don't give a shit. <laughs> So uh, the Brewers went one, two, three, four <laughs> times in this game, mostly all in the early innings. Um, but looking at it, the, the Brewers struck out 11 times, which is a little high. You mm-hmm. mentioned Ashby already. Uh, he did have to throw a lot of extra pitches due to errors. So I do think he probably would have gone longer uh, if that hadn't been the case. Um, only four of those eight runs that he gave up were earned runs. If you cut that even in half, um, we're looking at an eight and eight game. Mm-hmm. So, despite everything that transpired to get the Reds an eight to nothing lead, the Brewers didn't just say, you know, we'll get them tomorrow. And they gave themselves a chance to win by playing hard for all nine innings, like you said. Yep. So, the Brewers, um, two out runs. They scored three in the fifth and two in the sixth. So, five out of their eight runs that they scored in this game came with two outs. Love that. Yeah, as do I. Uh, and then uh, UL Piamps and Bryce Wilson were able to get back on track in this game. So that was a good thing for me as well. Like um, the Christian Yelich home run that was hit in this game uh, came off a left-handed pitcher. That is a great sign. Second home run off of a left-handed pitcher this season. He's got four home runs. Two of them are off lefties. Is it fair to say that he's back? Is it fair to say now? It's pretty fair to say that he's back. You know what's funny? Let me just put up a let me just put one thing up on the screen here quick for you. And and you can see just just look and see what his this is so this is so sick. Just to see this pop up. I'm excited for this now. 
I, I haven't seen this yet, so you're all seeing this with me for the first time. <laughs> Look at all that red. <laughs> Holy shit. Batting run value, 93rd percentile. Fielding run value, 81st percentile. Expected weighted on base average, 99th percentile. Expected batting average, 97th percentile. Expected slugging, 99th percentile. Barrel percentage, 93rd percentile. Hard hit percentage, 84th percentile. Sweet spot percentage, 85th percentile. Like, just look at all that red. That's where good Christian thing. Yelich is among the league leaders that in all of these thing. categories. I like that. So, yes, I think it is fair to say that he's back, which, yep. like I said, we've been saying since the All-Star break last year. Yes, for sure. Okay, let's go to last night's game now. What's it up to you from the second game of the Brewers and Red series? Well, the Brewers may have found a gem in Joe Ross, huh? What do you think about that? He's uh, one of those guys that the Brewers have to take chances on once in a while. They have to bet on guys having bounce-back seasons once in a while because yep. that's how they can get good players for not a lot of money by signing guys that are betting on themselves, say, coming back from injuries, a guy like Reese Hoskins. So I like the signing, and I like it. I will say uh, it's, a, it's, it's a great thing, and they're pretty good at it, man, honestly. They're pretty good at taking those gambles, uh, taking those estimated guesses, right? Yep. Uh, six and off third. is really great. Yeah, uh, five hits. Uh, three runs, only two of them earned, one walk in the seven Ks. I mean, he was great. Uh, obviously, this Reds offense is no joke, dude, uh, especially in their in their home stadium. So, I mean, to, to hold them uh, to to two earned runs for himself, I mean, that's fantastic, honestly. Um, on the offensive end of things, uh, RBIs from Yelich, he had three of them. He is so back. He's raking. Uh, Bowers with two. Uh, he's up to three on the year. Blake Perkins filled in very nicely, getting his first three RBIs of the season. And Frelick got an RBI, two out RBIs from Perkins and Yelich. Uh, six of 15 from runners in scoring position. So that's – in baseball, it's a good average. I have numbers for you. So I have so many numbers for you. That's fantastic stuff. And third straight game with the Brewers scoring at least eight runs. So, I mean, you can't complain, honestly. They got another win. Uh, hopefully they go into tonight and they – they could, you know, get get back to back and then, you know, guarantee at least a split in the series. And, you know, we, we move on to tomorrow after that, to today, tomorrow. But, um, you know, they played good. So you mentioned Joe Ross. Like you said, he was fantastic. If he can have an impact like Colin Ray has where we're talking about Colin Ray the way that we just did, mm -hmm. uh, the Brewers are going to be in really good shape. Yes. Uh, Freddie Peralta, in our bold prediction opinion, is going to be a Cy Young level pitcher. DL Hall, we've talked about the potential that he has. If you have two really solid studs like Colin Ray and Joe Ross in the middle of your rotation, and then we're talking about guys like Jacob Junis, and then you're talking about the potential of a guy like Aaron Ashby, and now Robert Gosser is coming back from his injury, and he's going to be pitching two innings in a uh, an extended spring training game soon, or not spring training, an extended minor league game soon. Um, I mean – I'm not worried. I didn't feel the need to add another starting pitcher towards the end of spring training. Mm -hmm. I feel they have enough guys. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bryce Durang and Blake Perkins, you mentioned already that they had um, just a bunch of really good at-bats. I broke down some of their at-bats. They, both of them, did really fantastic jobs at the plate, especially Blake Perkins. Um Again, if you're interested, check that out on our on our Facebook and YouTube pages. The way that they handled their at-bats, like I said, especially Blake Perkins, I'm really impressed. Really gives the Brewers a lot of options. And then yep. you mentioned Christian Yelich. His, the other thing with him is his ground ball percentage is the lowest that it's been since 2019. Wow. So he's not, not beating the ball into the ground as much, so he's not going to ground out as much which means that even though last year he was hitting the ball really hard, a lot of those are going to start to find grass instead of dirt. All so right. I'm, yeah, I I realize that we're two weeks into the season, but uh, I'm really optimistic for what 2024 holds for Christian Yelich. Yeah, for sure. Um, the Brewers went one, two, three twice, which was the first inning and the second inning. After that, 
they started just <laughs> just rallying. Honestly, um, three runs in the in the third inning, um, another two runs in the fifth inning, another mm-hmm. run in the sixth inning, two or three more in the seventh, and just really good work by the Brewers. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you some insane batting numbers with runners in scoring position in a second here. Uh, first, before I do that, I want to give Sal Freelick credit for the last three game stretch that he's been on. Mm-hmm. Sal Freelick in his last three games, seven for eleven with two walks. So seven for eleven is a six thirty six batting average. Yeah. Obviously not sustainable, but he's hot <laughs> right now. <laughs> that would be crazy. <laughs> and a 692 on base percentage in his last three games. Also not sustainable, but but he's hot right now. <laughs> Drove in three runs, scored four runs himself. His batting average in the last three games has gone up 150 points. Wow. He went from 174 to 324 in the last three games, which early in the season is a reason to not say dumb shit like send him down to chip away. <laughs> Yeah, let's send Sal Freelich, who is literally one of our most talented players on the team, with one of the highest ceilings, down to AAA because he's struggling in the first three games. Okay, so there's that. Now, what I have for you is the Brewers' numbers with runners in scoring position. So this is something that's been arguably their biggest problem since, what, 2020? Easily, yeah. Again, I'm aware that we are two weeks into the season. However, with runners in scoring position, the Brewers, number one in batting average in the entire Major League Baseball. I like that. Batting 362. Number three in on-base percentage with runners in scoring position at 432. Number two in slugging with runners in scoring position at 553. And number one in OPS with runners in scoring position at 985. So those are the team numbers. I would like to present to you some individual batting averages for runners in scoring position. Again, some of these are somewhat small sample sizes, like five or six at bats. However, just having, you know, 10 games into the season, guys having that many at bats with runners in scoring position is encouraging in and of itself. So, Joey Ortiz, a guy people are like, oh, we send him down. I can't believe we got this guy. We shouldn't even be playing him. He's three for five with runners in scoring position. That's a 600 batting average. William Contreras has a 545 batting average with runners in scoring position. As expected. <laughs> Christian Yelich and Blake Perkins are both batting 500 with runners in scoring position. Bryce Durang is batting 455 with runners in scoring position. And Sal Freelich and uh, Jake Bowers are both batting 333 with runners in scoring position. Wow. So, again, we're two weeks into the season, but the Brewers are doing very well at something that's been a weakness of theirs for the past four years. Yeah. And, you know, baseball is – it's a grind, uh, and it's a mental grind. So you kind of – and I can't speak from experience, obviously. I've never been in a major league baseball player. But if you could – and this is how I would deal with it. If you could incrementally tell yourself, okay, we're going to – we dominated, you know, this week. Let's dominate next week. And then, okay, eventually it becomes a month. Then it becomes two months of dominating. And that's a lot of mental grind. But these guys are used to it, right? So if they can, if they can, every two weeks keep telling themselves, okay, I had a good two weeks, I had a good two weeks, good two weeks, and over time, that's just going to look like you know we're a juggernaut offense, and that's going to be something that we have not been used to for the last couple of years. Yeah. I'll tell you that. With a lot of guys contributing too, it's not like you know we're just relying on Contreras and Yelich to carry or something like that. Right, like we were last year. It was kind of like, all right, this guy's probably going to fly out. This guy might you know hit a hit a, you know, a weak, weak hit over to right field. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll have a guy in second. Contreras is up after that. Hopefully he can pull through for us. Right. You know? and, and, and that's why Christian Yelich was leading off last season, because he was our most reliable guy to get on base. Yeah. Now we're using guys like Sal Freelich, Oliver Dunn, Jackson Churio, Garrett Mitchell, when he comes back, is going to bat lead off a lot. And that's what's allowing them to have Christian Yelich back in the three hole, 
driving in runs and still getting on base for the guys in the middle of the order, Willie Adamas and Reese Hoskins and Sal Freelich when he's there and Bryce Durang, the way that he's playing, all of these guys are contributing and that's what's making the Brewers offense really, really dangerous. You're not just looking at the first three guys of the batting order and saying, okay, once we get past that, we should be okay. Now it's yeah. like, okay, we got past their power hitters. Fuck. Now we got all these guys. We're going to just work seven pitch at bats and get on base anyways. Dude, That's Bryce what's Durang making this is, offense really dangerous. Bryce Terang is balling. He's hitting the ball hard. Dude, he he's seeing, seeing the ball so well. I was just going to say, he's seeing the goddamn thing so well. So, man, he is he's balling. If he keeps that up, you know, with his value on the defensive end, and we get a guy like – I Mitchell, think it's – and I think it's not in a, a bad situation. Um, I think, you know, he's not, you know, tearing the cover off the ball or anything, but I think Willie Adonis's plate discipline looks better than it did last year. Oh, for sure. He was going – He at times, man, you could tell he was – and that's why I talk about the mental, right? Uh, you know, people were kind of getting on him. He knew the pressure, you know, inside the, the clubhouse, outside the clubhouse, and – you know, there was talks of him getting traded. There was talks of him getting traded this offseason. And, you know, Pat Murphy, he might be the perfect manager for this Brewers team to kind of calm everybody down and, and keep them calm. And um, he has a he has a very distinct sense of humor, I'll say. But he's been fantastic for this team. And so, they look completely different. I pulled it up because I wanted to know if I'm feeling something correct or not. His mm -hmm. chase percentage last year was 31.8, which is pretty high. That's almost 32%. This year it's 24.1. That's much better. That's 7.7% lower chase percentage than he was last year. Now, 2023, his chase contact percentage, so this is contact on pitches outside of the strike zone, last year was 49.4. This year it's 66.7. Oh, wow. So when he is swinging at pitches outside of the zone, he's still making contact, even if it just means following pitches off. Because that's like we talked about with, with Jackson Cherio as a learning thing, mm -hmm. uh, that that's just something where you can live to see another pitch. Yeah, I like that. So I like that for Willie Adamas as well. So the Brewers have two more games against Cincinnati tonight and tomorrow. Yep. Then they play three against Baltimore. They're probably going to be facing Corbin Burns in that series. And now Jackson Holiday is called up. So... The Orioles, they're ready. So I'm really actually really looking forward to that series because it's just going to be good baseball. Regardless of how many games the Brewers win, it's just going to be good baseball. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have three against San Diego at home, which brings me to my next point. Tuesday night is going to be our next watch party. It's going to be our last free watch party, at least for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, Jake and I are going to be doing a pregame and a postgame show for the Tuesday night game against the Padres. Jake and I are going to have our own pregame show where we're doing all the pitching matchups and the, you know, the trends and uh, injury reports and matchups and all of that stuff, all of that in our own pregame show that we're going to create. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to have a postgame show after the game as well, as well as being live during the entire game. So you can watch a baseball game with us on Tuesday. Um, that is what our Patreon subscription is for. It's for watch parties. And the people that are subscribed to our Patreon, they get to pick the games that we cover for the following month. So if you subscribe to our Patreon during April, you will get to pick which games we're going to cover for May, which can include up to two bucks playoff games. Um, so that, and then there's a ton of brewery games to choose from as well in the month of May. And Jake and I are hoping that we can kind of get some, you know, maybe some technical things ironed out this summer during the brewery season that we can we can really have these streamlined and ready to go for when the Packers are going to start. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting. A lot of fun. Um, would love to show our our IQ uh, as it's spread out through all the sports. I mean, obviously, we did the Bucks one. Uh, we're going to talk about Bucks here here shortly. We did the the last Bucks and Thunder game, which they play them coming up. Yep. Uh, one of the last three games of the season. Uh, we're going to do a baseball one, so uh, we're going to bring all the stats that we can, bring you a bunch of numbers, uh, give you some predictions in the in the pregame show, and you know we're going to show our IQ with baseball and then football, man. I mean, if you haven't been watching our draft specials, man, I mean, you're missing out, really. Uh, Tyler, myself, Simon, Brian, we put a lot of work into this stuff, a lot of planning, uh, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that you guys don't get to see, a lot of late nights, um, a lot of early, morning early mornings, 
of early mornings of God damn it, I got to go to work again. Yep. <laughs> and you know, you're just hurting because you're so tired, man. But you know, at the end of the day, it's it's something that we love, and we like to flex our IQ. We like to show that we know our stuff, and we do a lot of research. So I'm not gonna act bashful about it, man, because I do a lot of work, and I know you do too. And and I'm gonna speak for you. I don't do that a lot, but I know that you do a lot of work behind the scenes that nobody really really knows and appreciates. But it's a lot of stuff, man. Honestly, so. We have our final draft preview this Friday. Please come check us out. It's going to be running backs and linebackers, which is going to be two very important positions the Packers are looking at. They're drafting an offensive lineman in the first round. Just going to let you all know that right now. But, you know, linebacker and running back, uh, for the for the rest of those picks, we have two second rounders, two third rounders. We have 11 picks total. D- that's definitely positions they're going to be looking at. So uh, come check us out on Friday, and we're going to, we're going to give you some stuff on that. Uh, but, yeah. People are going to get to see us four times awesome, in the next dude. week. What's that? People are going to get to see us four times the next week. Today, Friday, Tuesday, and Wednesday again. Man, hey, lucky you guys. Lucky <laughs> you guys. My family doesn't get to see me four times sometimes. <laughs> All right. You ready to move into the Bucks now? Yes. Let me uh, let me flip to my Bucks section. All right. I'm just going to throw my things out there about the Grizzlies because I don't have a ton. Okay, so with ahead. no Dame, no Chris, and no Patrick Beverly, I don't mm-hmm. understand why people are trying to attach so much importance to games like this. They're mm-hmm. not going to play without these guys in the playoffs. And if there is a scenario where that happens, we shouldn't be expecting to be the same team without our second and third best players. Amen. Jaron Jackson Jr. is a beast. Give him his credit. Yep. Um, letting an injured Grizzlies team score 111 points is a little much, but not so much that I'm going to throw a fit about it. Man, we went over the averages, man. I gave you guys numbers uh, not that long ago. Yeah. The lowest scoring team in the league would be the highest scoring team in the league just 10 years ago. Think yep. 10 years. 10 years is a long time for some things. Not that long when you talk about the the you know evolution of the NBA. I mean, honestly, 10 years, that's crazy. <laughs> that's wild. Um, for the Bucks to score 101 points on a night that Giannis got off to a slow start and Malik Beasley, Jay Crowder, and Patrick Con- or Pat Connaughton didn't shoot the ball well. It is what it is. Uh, the offense struggled without two of their best scorers, three of their primary ball handlers, and two of their best passers. Shocker. Yeah, it happens. Um, Brooke Lopez did have a very efficient night, 25 points and 10 rebounds. Giannis had 21, seven rebounds, eight assists, and five blocks. Pat Connaughton didn't shoot well, but he still had six rebounds and eight assists, um, yep. kind of occupying that backup point guard role. Bobby Portis. 19 points, 7 rebounds, 3 assists, a steal, and 2 blocks. He was 8 of 16 from the field and 3 of 5 behind the 3-point line. Bobby Portis's pre- and post-All-Star game numbers are something that people should be giving Doc Rivers at least a little bit of credit for. Good. Obviously, Bobby Portis is the one doing these things, but Doc Rivers is using Bobby Portis in a different way than I think Adrian Griffin was. I agree. He's and I think that is something that Doc Rivers really should be given credit for, despite people not wanting to give Doc Rivers credit for anything. The way that Bobby Portis is playing should be one of them. So pre-All-Star game, Bobby Portis is averaging 12.7 points, 6.9 rebounds, and 1.1 assists, shooting 49.4% on field goals, 38.5% on threes. He had eight double-doubles in 56 games. Those are okay numbers. They're okay numbers. I'm not not six-man-of-the-year numbers. Yeah. But they're okay numbers. Yeah. Post-All-Star break, Bobby Portis is averaging 15.6 points a game, 8.3 rebounds, 1.5 assists, shooting 51.7% on field goals, 41.7% on threes, and had six double-doubles in 21 games. That's Bobby so, Portis. points up by almost three a game. Rebounds up by 1.4 a game. Assists up by 0.4 a game. Field goal percentage up by 2%. Three-point percentage up by 3%. And had almost the same number of double-doubles in half as many games. Less than half as many games. Yeah. That's Bobby Portis. That's that's where like Bobby Portis is back into the six-man-of-the-year conversation. Yep, I agree with that. All right. So what do you have from Bucks and Grizzlies? <laughs> So I don't have much as well. I mean, Brooke Lopez had a good game, even though everybody wants to th- say that he's a trash can. I mean, 25 and 10, that's really nothing to scoff at. Five three-pointers. I mean, I don't know what much else you're going to ask from the guy. I will say this, though. Losing the points 
the points in the paint by 40 points and allowing 76 points in the paint. That's disgusting. I don't like that. I don't like any of that. And, you know, the Bucks were in this bad streak. They lost, you know, going back to, to last week, the Wizards, the Grizzlies, uh, a couple other teams in there. And really the thing that the thing that was a common theme was they were kind of compounding their own problems. And it, it really all was the second half. Um, so if I can go back to the Wizards game, they shot 19 of 47 total in the second half. That's 40%. And 7 of 24 from three, that's 29%. You fast forward to this Grizzlies game. They shot 16 of 41, 39%. And I uh, can't read my own air rating. Nine of 26 from the three-point line, 34%. So, I mean, really just taking bad shots and, you know, not rotating quick enough on defense at times was really something that, you know, they, they did to themselves. But again, again, I'm going to hammer this home because I know this is a point that you're going to want to make. Being without two of our three best players hurts. It hurts on both ends. <laughs> I don't care what people say about Damian Lillard. The guy wants to win. And you know what? He actually plays pretty good defense from time to time. And he communicates, and he's a leader, and people listen to him. And he can pick some pockets once in a while. He's ve- he got very quick hands. So, you know, being without two of your three best players, you know, spacing on offense for one, that's the biggest thing, especially in today's NBA. So yeah. that could go right into the factor of the field goal percentage. And then the defense, you know, Chris is one of the main leaders, and that's that's where he makes his main impact is he has a voice and people listen. He's a very, very smart player, very high basketball IQ. Now, does he have sloppy turnovers from time to time? Yes. Yes. Do his legs give out on him from time to time? Same thing with Damian Lillard on the offensive end? Yes. Those guys play hard, okay? So their legs are going to go out. I mean, it happened last night to, to Jalen Brown. He was playing hard on defense, and he shot some shots that were just like, no chance, buddy. But I, do, I don't get on those guys for that kind of stuff because they're playing hard on both ends. That is exhausting stuff. We've talked so, about it with me, with Malik Beasley, too. We have. And, you know, Malik is in a funk right now, and people are kind of like, oh, he's trash, he's this, he's this. Listen, bro, just it, it, he's going to have ebbs and flows, dude. It, yep. It's going to happen. And does it, does it kind of – and, again, I said the Bucks were compounding. It kind of compounds the situation right now with Bucks fans where – the Bucks are losing games against teams. Malik Beasley's getting some good looks, good looks at the basket, right? Especially from a spot that we saw him be on fire from during the season, and he's missing. And, and you know what? It fucking happens, dude. The, you, you don't happens. get average of of thirty eight percent on threes by only shooting thirty eight percent every game. You're <laughs> gonna have some fifties. You're gonna have some twenty sixes. Yeah, and that's how you get to thirty eight. And three of seven. I mean. Could it be better? Could it be four of seven? Absolutely. Could it be five of seven? One hundred percent. That's what Brooke Lopez was. But you know what? Brooke Lopez has had plenty of games where he's been three of seven, and Malik Beasley has been five of seven from three. And you know what? Shocker! People have called Brooke Lopez trash during those three of seven games. So three it is seven what it is. Three isn't even bad. Yeah, three of seven is not bad at all. <laughs> I'm just, just honestly three. three for eight isn't terrible for three point percentage. Not in the NBA, dude. That's still thirty seven and a half percent. Not with how these guys can shoot. Not with how these guys can play defense. Not how long and athletic these guys are. Three for seven is fine, dude. Yep. But uh, I yep. digress. Don't lose the points in the paint by 40 <laughs> points and you'll be okay. Yeah. Especially for a game they lost by 10 points. Yeah. All right. Bucks and Raptors. What's it up to you from that one? <sighs> I got to stay, man. I mean, being without Giannis in this game, getting Dane back. Uh, Dane, you know, struggled from the three point line, four of 12. That's not great, but he gets double teamed a lot, and there's a lot of pressure on him offensively. He tries to draw fouls too. <laughs> Here goes Steve talking, talking that shit, bro. <laughs> Chris Middleton had a, had a very good, very efficient game. Uh, Bobby Portis with a double double. And, you know, I broke down the mix and the misses again in the second half. So in the third quarter, they made nine shots, missed 12 shots. Seven of those 12 missed shots they had in the third quarter were from the paint. Mm. That's not great. They had four made threes, missed three, so four of seven from the three-point line. That kind of, you know, kept them in it. In the fourth quarter, they had nine makes again, and they had 12 misses again. 11 of the 12 misses in the fourth quarter from the three-point line. So one quarter, they were missing in the paint. The next quarter... I appreciate that, Steve. 
You, hey, man, you know it's all love when we talking shit, man. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> um, 11 of the 12 misses that the Bucks had in the in the fourth quarter was from the three-point line. So one quarter, they missed from the paint. The other quarter, they missed their three-pointers. So that's just what happens, man. That, that's yeah. just what happens. Sometimes it is you just don't get the bounces. So, I mean, overall, they went 18 of 46 in the second half. And they went 6 of 20 from the three-point line. So, I mean – they just – and they were doing this thing where they would play very good in the first halves, moving the ball, great energy on defense. And then in the second half, the ball would get a little sticky, man. they do a lot of ISO and a lot of forced shots. And that's where you're getting guys like, you know, Malik, you know, Dane would, have, Dane would try to create a shot, have two people on him. He'd throw it out to Malik. Malik, it's a one shot and you're done. Like, what the hell is that? That's not Bucks basketball. We are better than that. And, you know, I I know that we don't want to hear this stuff. But this, this is the stuff that, that they look at, and this is the stuff that we have to look at as fans so we can understand how they can get better. And it's not a bad thing to say that you need to improve on stuff. Is it a bad time for it? Absolutely. But this is the kind of stuff that you have to take responsibility for your own actions. And you know what? It is what it is. They lost this game. No Giannis, Damon, and, and Chris did their thing, but – the others didn't pick it up enough, and that's just what happens, man. I want to put a pin in what you just said, too, about being able to identify that things need to improve. Uh, because when we get to, you know, when we get to the totality of after the Knicks game, mm-hmm. is I want to discuss that there are ways to go about addressing those things. Yes, 100%. So, Steve, real quick, Saturday, I'm hoping I can play. I've been sick this week, so. Hopefully, I can play on Saturday. But I'm undefeated up here. Anyways, <laughs> um, I do appreciate you saying that uh, that you love what we're doing and that you're a fan. Now, Christopher, you miss – if you weren't watching the whole time, you're going to have to go back and rewatch what I said about the Brewers because I had lots of stats during the Brewers segment. Stats, Chris. Stats. Stats on stats. So, I agree with you strongly during these this three-game losing streak that they had to the Grizzlies, Raptors, and Knicks that they played mm-hmm. really good in the first halves. Mm-hmm. especially on both ends, and actually the Celtics game as well. Um, Celtics, or Celtics, the Raptors did actually end up getting a lot of fast break points off of turnovers in the second half, and that's what mm-hmm. kind of helped them kind of get back into the game. And then they caught fire from the three-point line as well. Um, same with Gary Trent in the fourth quarter. He had some really tough threes. Andre Jackson Jr. gave some great energy, as he does, and Doc Rivers gave him praise for that in the post game. Mm-hmm. Chris Middleton cooked in the fourth quarter. He was four of seven from the field, two for five on threes. That's 57.1% and 40% respectively from those two things. He made the only two threes that the Bucs had in the fourth quarter of this game. Mm. The Bucs were two for 13, and Chris made the only two. The rest of the Bucs were 0 for 8 on threes in the fourth quarter. Mm-hmm. So that plus Damian Lillard following out when the Bucs were down four with a minute 48 to go is tough. Um especially playing out with guys like Giannis. And then I will say this, the the Bucks had a lot of shots that it felt like like hit a bunch of parts of the rim and then bounced out. Yeah, they, they weren't getting the bounces, man. It is what it is. Um, And my thing with this losing streak is that the Bucks didn't lose any ground in the seating. So bottom line, or whatever you think about their record, they're still in the same spot. <laughs> yeah, still right now. Still, yeah, to this day, still in the same spot. And my thing with the with the Grizzlies and Raptors game and even the Wizards game before that, the Bucks just need some progression towards their average three-point percentage. They shot 22.9% on threes against the Wizards and 28.6% on threes against the Raptors. That Just a little bit of progression towards the average, and they'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Now, going into Bucks and Knicks, this, again, is another game where the Bucks were pretty aggressive on both ends in the first half. Um, Chris Middleton was working hard. Pat Connaughton was defending Jalen Brunson well. Some of the turnovers let the Knicks hang around a little bit. But, I mean, Giannis being aggressive in the fast break helped them finish the first quarter on a 6-0 run. And he scored or assisted on 13 straight points at the start of the second quarter. Mm -hmm. Third quarter is obviously where this game was decided. Uh, The Knicks played a near flawless third quarter. Yeah, they... They whooped our ass in the third quarter, dude. They shot 14 of 19 from the field. That's 73.7%. Mm-hmm. 
Four or five from the three-point line is 80%, and seven for eight from the free-throw line is 87.5%. They had 10 assists on 14 field goals. That's pretty much as great of a quarter as you can play. Yeah, and they started the third quarter on an 18-6 to six run. So we were up 11 at half. They scored us by 12 on that run. They came on, the they punched us, and we did not The Bucks back. didn't even have a bad third quarter. The Bucks shot 47.1% on field goals, 37.5% on threes, and 83.3% from the free throw line. The Bucks didn't even have a bad quarter. Yeah, the Knicks were just outstanding. They went crazy. Yeah. Now, I, I took it upon myself to find out if what people were saying in – I got to stop listening to what people say on Facebook – I get why when when people get really big that they don't pay attention to comments and stuff, which we try to do. But trying to pay attention to what people say on the internet, it's taxing, to say the least. So the people, I've seen a lot of people saying that the Bucks are sucking in the third quarters and you know they're coming out of halftime, dragging. And so I decided to look at it. Through their last three games, so the the Grizzlies, the Raptors, and the Knicks, I looked at their third and their fourth quarters over those last three games. And the last three games in the third quarter, they were minus three. The last three games in the fourth quarter, minus 19. Mm-hmm. So looking at the Bucks in the fourth quarter from the two-point the two point area and the three-point line, it's pretty telling why they lost these three games, in my opinion, honestly, mm-hmm. and why they were minus 19 mm-hmm. in the fourth quarter of these three games. So against the Knicks, they were 5 for 12 on threes. Not bad. That's almost 50%. Yep. 2 for 8 on twos. And then the Raptors and Grizzlies games were the opposite. Against the Raptors, they were 8 of 9 on twos, 2 for 13 on threes. Against the Grizzlies, they were 6 for 7 on twos, 3 for 16 on threes in the fourth quarter. That's why we respect you, James. That's why we respect you. Yeah. Appreciate a Celtics fan saying that they're glad to hear Giannis isn't seriously hurt. I I did not even did not even cross my mind to go on, on Celtics Twitter last night. I was like, I'm not even gonna try to cross that bridge. No. Christopher said Twitter analysts are my favorite. <laughs> bro, they I was looking at the Twitter doctors, bro, bro. They they're just hilarious, bro. <laughs> Everybody is a doctor, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Or somebody saying that they thought that Giannis was having an ACL injury while he's grabbing the middle of his calf. Yeah, I was like, what are you? What ACL injury are you? <laughs> Chris said really? it was an amazing bridge to cross. <laughs> yeah, this game doesn't matter to us. Yeah, I saw that one too. I saw this is their championship. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, I got. Um, so play. versus the Knicks, the Bucks did get their fourth quarter three point shooting going, but they didn't finish their twos like they did against Toronto and Memphis. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to foreshadow this a little bit, but the Bucks they might just need to loosen up. The first half, they look good, fast, aggressive. The second half, they looked tight, feeling like they need to end their losing streak. So that kind of caused them to play a little rigid, in my opinion. Now, I'm not, and I know I saw your reaction to somebody else bringing this up. I'm not using Chris Middleton as an excuse to why the Bucks lost. But I do believe him to be part of the solution. I'm, I'm, so not I'm not mad at that. I'm not okay. mad at that. So it's, not. it's not an excuse, but part of the fix, part of the solve, part of the solution to be part of why the Bucks, you know, like can fix what they're doing going forward, what happened during this losing streak. So he was off to a decent start. He was two for four from the field, one for one from the three point line. He had five points, two rebounds, and two assists. Uh-huh. He and got, well. and he played pretty efficiently against the Raptors. Mm -hmm. Um, and then gets hit in the face. The fact that people have the audacity to call him injury prone for getting hit in the face. Like how fucking stupid do you have to be to call somebody injury prone for getting hit in the face? How is that at all something that is within any shadow of a realm of possibility in their own control. That is one of the dumbest things I have seen people say on the internet in a good while. No, I understand, James, but like I was at the game last night, James. So immediately when I saw him go down, I was like, where's he grabbing? I was looking for the hands. 
and he was he was grabbing the calf like upper calf you know usually when it's achilles they grab like the heel you know because that's mm -hmm. really where it is and right. you know they usually like ah and they're like screaming because it's like that's a lot of pain and like i would never want to experience that so when he had his hands like up here and then the next thing i noticed like when he tried to stretch it out i was like oh yeah he's okay yeah so on my point about chris middleton versus the knicks in the fourth quarter when they're struggling from two point if they can use his playmaking, his shot creating, and shot making when they need a two point bucket, a shot from the mid range, you know, a lob to the basket, something like that, that's where, in my opinion, Chris Middleton is part of that solution for how the Bucks struggled against the against the Knicks from two point territory. Now, yeah. one other person I want to address what people are saying on the internet about them is Pat Connaughton. Oh, God. Every day, it's something new that people say, oh, Pat Connaughton only scored four points. He's trash. Why are we even playing him? Why is he getting any minutes? Pat Connaughton can't play defense. Why is he playing? He's trash. The fact that I have to continue to tell people that since the All-Star break, that Pat Connaughton is one of our top five defenders by defensive rating, and that people still then choose to not believe that when I'm literally giving you the statistic, it, it makes our fan base look bad. Like you are literally in the face of factual statistics, choosing to still believe your personal feelings over numbers. I'm gonna get into it when we get to the next game. I'm gonna I'm gonna cook on this next game real quick. But okay, so I got something to say. Just about Pat it. Connaughton defensively, people were saying, "Oh, Jalen Brunson kept scoring on him." Pat Connaughton actually played pretty decent defense against Jalen Brunson. To be honest with you. Four for nine from the field when guarded by Pat Connaughton. That's 44.4%. Not terrible. Jalen Brunson, Brunson is a bucket. He scores on people. That's what he does. He's a bucket. He so went to New York. To four for nine. Not bad. Yeah. The he Knicks literally... as a team against Pat Connaughton, five for 19. Nope. He plays no defense. That's not true, Tyler. 26.3% of the Knicks shot from the field as a team against Pat Connaughton. And four of those five are their best player. Wow. Wow. That means the rest of their team was one for ten when guarded by Pat Connaughton. Wow. I don't want to hear shit else about Pat Connaughton not being able to play defense. And I'll tell you where you can go find these numbers. You go to NBA.com. You find the game you're looking for. So in this case, you go to Sunday. You click on Bucks Knicks box score. You go to where it says um, on the top, it gives you like the traditional numbers. You click that, scroll down to matchups, defensive player, Pat Connaughton. That tells you what everybody shoots, how many points they scored, how many assists, turnovers, field goals, three pointers. Gives you everything, gives you how many possessions they were guarded by him, yep. how many minutes they were guarded by him. And you can find for yourself that the Knicks shot 26.3% against Pat Connaughton, five for 19. From the field against him. I don't want to hear shit that Pat Connaughton doesn't play defense because you can literally find it. And I just told you where. See, <laughs> before I cook, I gotta say, I gotta respond to Chris. Chris said, dang, explain him where to get the stats. Yes, Chris. This is this is where we get our stats. And the crazy thing about this is it's on the internet, and people have access to the internet to do whatever they want, except most people just bitch and complain on there. Here's the thing. That's on a free site. You don't even have to pay. It's not even like Pro <laughs> yeah, Football that's, Focus, that's which we pay for, to use for football stats. Yeah. NBA.com, totally free. Yeah. You can go yeah. find that for free. Yeah. You you could like go to Google and type NBA.com, and then you like like that's the first step to and then and then and then you follow Tyler step by step, as James said, Barney style, explaining it. This is how you do this, and then you know once you find that, you could take that and you can shut the hell up. Yeah. That, that's and really... here's the thing. Let me let me take it a step further. If you do this before you make a post on a Facebook, you can save yourself from looking stupid. Oh, that that is a great idea, Tyler. I think a lot of people, I think we should make that into a clip and, and just and just pin that to the page so people will stop saying dumbass shit. Yeah. Honestly, I'm up to here with it. Okay? I hang out with a damn 11-year-old every single day, and he sounds a lot smarter than most of you on the goddamn Facebook. Yeah, I am so far over what people are saying, dude. Tyler, you get me riled up? You get me riled up? It's not time yet. You I got a win to discuss it before that, so. 
I'm just going to say quickly what I think about the Knicks game. First of all, Bucks played tremendous defense in the first half, holding them to 50 points, back-to-back quarters of, of 25 points. That's awesome. That's fantastic. The Knicks came out, punched us in the mouth, scored 39 in the third quarter. Again, they played flawless. They were fantastic in the third quarter, and they scored 33 in the fourth quarter. The Bucks were outscored 72 to 48 in the second half. Uh, because of that and, and of that, the New York Knicks shot 26 of 41 from the field. They were shot 63% from the field. They didn't miss. They were on fire, dude. They were hitting all cylinders. Everybody was complaining about DiVincenzo, blah, blah, blah. DiVincenzo was having a good year. It happens. It's fine. Okay? They shot 67% from behind the three-point line in the, in the second half, 10 of 15. I mean, that's crazy. That is crazy. They're going to beat – they're beating every team in the league shooting 67% from three. I'm telling you right now, especially at that volume. Okay? Yeah, that's tough. I don't give a shit what team it is. Now the box, the the Bucks, the Bucks shot twenty seven of thirty two from the free throw line. The Knicks shot eighteen of twenty two. Which, when you look at the total number of free throws, and you go to the next game, sounds absolutely asinine. <laughs> so crazy. Um, long story short, the Bucks, they just they did what they were doing right. And you know, you broke it down with the three games. I broke it down for the whole losing streak. And the whole losing streak, they shot in the second half. The second half's only. They shot 68 of 171 from the field. That's 39%. It's not going to get it done. And they shot 29 of 88 from the three-point line. That's 32%. Again, that's not going to get it done. But by the law of averages and the law of our talent that we have on our team, that shit ain't happening for too damn long. Okay? I'm just going to tell you that right now. Now, Definitely not over a seven-game series against the same team. <laughs> no, because they're going to figure some shit out. Okay? Um, now we move on to the Celtics game, which I was at last night. I'm just going to make a point real quick. I am so embarrassed to be in this fan base sometimes. Pat Connaughton got onto the floor, checks into the game, and I am not shitting you when I say this. About nine people around me I heard grumbling about Pat Connaughton on the floor. I am absolutely not kidding. I wish I was. (sighs) They were like, oh, this guy's going to score. Pat sucks on defense. And then Pat Connaughton comes in, plays good defense, and grabs a rebound right away and gives it to Damian Lillard. And still nobody is happy because I heard people mockingly clapping and saying, oh, wow, Pat Connaughton did something on defense. Just tell me you're an idiot. Just just literally walk around with a shirt that says, I'm an idiot and I don't know anything about basketball. Just, Just wear that. Because, there, holy crap, dude. There is literally a such thing as role players. Guys that play roles. Yeah. Not every single player's role is to score. And you know what? And I'm gonna I'm just gonna backpack off that real quick. Pat Connaughton is being asked to do a lot of roles this year. Mm-hmm. His role has changed two, three times. Yep. And people do not recognize that. Even in the last week, week and a half. Yeah. He is asked, he is being asked to do a lot of shit right now. Mm-hmm. And the Bucks are in some turmoil. We've had some injury problems. We literally switched coaches and it had a mini, like two, two a days camp in the middle of our goddamn season. We signed Damian Lillard, got rid of Drew Holiday. That was a big change. There's a lot of shit going on, man. A Pat Connaughton's been going like on. the Swiss Army knife in the middle of it. And I literally have heard people say stuff like, Pat Connaughton's not athletic enough. Bro, do you know who you're talking about, bro? Pat Connaughton is literally one of the most athletic players on the Bucks. I am not even kidding. He was literally in the dunk contest. The dude literally had one of the top five verticals in the NBA for the past how many years? He got drafted to the MLB because he has a mid-90s fastball. The dude is a freak athlete. Nah, Chris is exactly. saying you, the Chris. same thing as you were typing it in. Thank you. Thank you. So, real quick, I'm just going to hit a couple things, and then I'm going to let you have the floor. The The scoring, the balanced scoring was a beautiful thing to watch. Mm. That was awesome. Yeah. Giannis said 15. Chris with 12. Big buckets in the fourth quarter when we needed it. Just I got his number. Damian Lillard played well, 12 points. Pat Bev was a leading scorer, 20 and 10 for Pat Bev. Who the hell thought that, right? 
Bobby Portis with a double double, and the bench outside of Bobby had 15 points. So I mean, the balance scoring all the way around was tremendous. Everybody was contributing in ways that they could, but the defense and the Celtics miss shots that they're not going to always miss. Okay, and you know, missing Porzingis is a big thing for them. But we also lost Giannis in the third quarter, so that's a big that's a bigger thing for us, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Now, I continued my second half. Um, stats because the Milwaukee Bucks in the second half shot 17 of 38. I almost wanted to be a nerd and sing the song. <laughs> I, I see your smile. I do when I when I wrote that down, I was like 17 38. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to sing it. But 44 percent honestly livable with the defense they were playing. They shot seven of 18 from three. That's 38 percent again livable with the defense they were playing. I'll take that. I'll take 38 percent. The Bucks came out and played playoff level defense in this yep. game. And shout out to Jason Tatum. Every time I was standing up and screaming and thought that we were going to just going to absolutely blow the doors open in this game, he would dunk on one of our players. And I was like, it's not great. That That's not great. But, you know, compared to the Celtics, you know, 44% for us, 48% for them, 20 of 41. They they missed a lot of shots that, the, that you know, the Bucs kind of had a hand in, in my opinion. They played some tough defense. And from the three-point line, and everybody know, should know this by now, the Celtics shoot the most and make the most threes in the NBA. In this game, in the second half, they shot eight of twenty-six in the second half. That's thirty percent. So, if the if they were four of fifteen in the third and four of eleven in the fourth quarter, so if the Bucks can can do that, and, and overall the Celtics were seventeen of fifty-two, by the way, hmm. from the three-point line. So, if the Bucks can do that, play some good perimeter defense, and have balanced scoring, I mean, obviously we're going to need Giannis to be superhuman at least once or twice against the Celtics if we end up matching up with them in the playoffs. That's just what's going to happen. That's the nature of the beast of being a superstar. You're going to be asked to score 40 or 50 points, especially to bring us over the hump, right? But I want to hit on this free throws thing, and I know you got the stat. But I got to tell you, man, I was just watching the game. I I haven't been to a game in a long time. Uh, Probably since – I think it was 2021, the last game I went to when we played the the 76ers on TNT in the middle of the season. That was the home opener this year. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I was watching the game and I was like, didn't even realize that it was just, you know, they're scoring, we're scoring, you know, we're playing good defense. I'm just excited that we're playing consistent defense. Cause you know, I was getting really nervous around halftime. I'm like, all right, we're going to see how they do in the second half. We're going to see if the ball is sticky, you know, if they're compounding their problems, if they're not, if they're not rotating on defense, like we're going to find out if this team is really serious. And I want to backtrack to some comments that Giannis made after the Knicks game. I loved what I heard, dude. Absolutely loved what I heard. He was talking about where was the fun, where was the swag, things that we have pointed out before about other teams. And, you know, he talked about where's the shimmy, where's the – what's the last time Pat Conte did one of these? Like, he was, he was pointing out some really important stuff. And early in this game, Bobby Portis got a dunk. And he gave us the Bobby shimmy, boy. And I was like, there it is. That's a role player listening to the leader. You're telling me that they don't hear your voice? That's bullshit. Yeah. I watched an interview with Gilbert Arenas. I'm just going to say this. I'm going to give you the floor. I watched an interview with Gilbert Arenas, and he had a chance to go to the Knicks when he was in his prime. And they asked him, why don't why didn't you come to New York? And this could very well be a reason why KD didn't go to New York and he went to the Nets instead. I don't know. I can't confirm that, but I can confirm what Gilbert Arena said. And Gilbert Arena said some dumb stuff, but this is this is absolutely true. This is his personal feelings. He said, the reason I didn't go to the Knicks is because of the fans. He said, as an opponent, we know that if we come in there and we start whooping y'all players' ass. You're going to start booing them. And then I'm going to be on their ass even more. They're going to get double pressure. No player wants to deal with that. So the next time you think about posting some some hateful stuff online, please shut up. Yeah. And like we said, being in a small market, people have to be an X factor. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely true, especially in baseball even. Um. I didn't see his post-game interview. I've seen a couple clips from his podcast since 
the the Pulse game, but shout out to Patrick Beverly for being inserted into the starting lineup, uh, yeah. former Lake Beasley, and leading the Bucks with 20 points. Dude, 10 rebounds, bro. <laughs> yeah. So Patrick Beverly, that dude, he deserves every single shred, piece, crumb of respect you could possibly have for anybody. Patrick mm-hmm. Beverly deserves all of it. Yes, sir. The fact that he's already playing through a wrist injury that's going to require surgery after the season, which they wanted him to have during and end his season, the fact that he's already playing through that and then rolled his ankle, missed a couple games, and is now back playing through that as well, Man. he is the embodiment of a dog. And I hope the Bucks bring him back next year. Me too. So I want to give credit to... Brooke Lopez, he got off to a four for five start from the three point line and had two blocks in the first quarter. So it set the tone there. The Bucks were raining threes in the first quarter. They jumped out to a 16 point lead. They were eight for 10 on threes in the first quarter. They did to the Celtics what the Celtics do to other people. Yep. Brooke Lopez. Um, the Bucks were showing really good energy on defense and on offense. And then this was fantastic to watch because they fed into each other. The Bucks playing good defense fed into their energy on offense. Scoring on offense gave them more energy for defense. It was perfect. It's perfect. They and you mentioned the the playoff level defense, and the Bucks were definitely the more physical team. And this feeds into the the free throw thing, which Christopher said the the Patrick Beverly thing was. I don't get to the damn line anyways. <laughs> that is that is very funny. Um. I actually like the, the refs let them play. I like that. I and I have that. tons of stats on the free throws, and I'll get to them when I finish saying the rest of what I want to say. Yep. But I like that the refs let them play. It, it made the game smoother. Didn't feel choppy. Didn't hear tons of whistles. But I liked it. It made it more about the players than it does about the refs. I didn't even realize that there was only two free throws in the game until the game was almost over. The, the thing yeah. that I noticed, because I was watching both of the games at the same time, was that the Brewer game started like an hour before the Bucks game, and the Bucks game ended like 10 minutes before the Brewers game. That's wild, bro. Um, Brett, that is typical Celtics fans moving the goalposts, saying that they love how felt Celtics fans are like, it didn't matter, we locked up the one seed. Uh, when you have your starters in until six minutes left in the fourth, and then Shaq basically bashing the Bucks. I love that even Doc said that. Yeah. Honestly, it doesn't even pay attention or doesn't even pay to pay attention to what any national media is saying about the Bucks. Yeah. Especially guys like Brian Windhorst and Kendrick Perkins. Because they both hate the Bucks because they don't want small markets to have nice things, especially Brian Windhorst. Well, they don't they don't even know what the word small means. You look at those fucking guys. <laughs> I'm sorry, it had to be said. I'm not a small guy either, but at least I have a damn neck, dude. <laughs> Listen, there's there's a reason, and this is mean to say, coming from a show that we do, you know, optimistic and positive. There's a reason why people call Brian Windhorse Brian Windbag. <laughs> he doesn't want Milwaukee to have nice things. He is an he's an NBA insider. He doesn't want the Bucks to have Giannis. He wants him to be in L.A., Chicago, New York, Golden State. He doesn't want the Bucks to have nice things. And Kendrick Perkins, he says, hates everyone. I'm sure of it. He never has anything nice to say about anyone. Maybe it's just to try to tear other people down to make himself feel better for averaging 2.7 points for his career. Bro, go watch his lowlights, bro, and then realize <laughs> who's talking about NBA. Seriously. First said Perkins trash talk. I'm here for it. Uh, the low lights, like the 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 eleven bro. step non travel call, is always my favorite. Bro, on the Cavs, bro, that's the best one, dude. This man's inching <laughs> towards the rim. He's like, I don't know what to do with this thing. Uh, yes, oh, Brett. Man. Um, Windhorse is the one that's constantly posting about the Giannis going to the Knicks. James, yeah. I was gonna point that out, bro. I was gonna point out, like, bro, even a even a Celtics fan is talking about Bert. bro. He didn't do shit on that damn team, bro. He didn't. He's definitely a participation trophy ring for. Come for on, Perkins. man. Okay, freaking Eddie House did way more for that team than freaking Kendrick Perkins. James Posey did more for that team than Kendrick Perkins. James Posey was a stud, dude, and people got to. He was. James Posey he was a big part of the Heat's first ring with he Wayne was, Wade. Dude. 
He was a bucket, man. He was a primetime player. Yeah, he was He was a good three-point shooter. Mm-hmm. Okay. Third quarter, I just want to throw this out there. Patrick Beverly, the Celtics were kind of daring him to shoot threes, and maybe it was to test out his wrist injury to see how he's shooting with it. But to his credit, he started two for three on threes in the second half. Bro, how, how about his freaking shot where he dribbled around in a circle and then faded away? I was like, what Bro, the He bucketed Luke Cornett twice in a row for his own personal 5-0 run. Yeah, dude, that was just crazy. Because he did. Like you said, he dribbled all the way around and then did a fucking sky hook. I was like, what? And then he did the too small. I'm like, no, he did not. But yes, he did. Bro, so the funniest thing, we had these like little like eight, nine-year-olds behind us. There was like six of them, like right in a row. And then the dad and the mom on the on the bookends, right? And these kids were freaking freaking out when Pat Bev went crazy. Pat Bev did the hook shot and they were all like, oh, oh, too small, too small. And I was like, that literally just made that play so much better for me. That made Dude, that play and, so and much then the very next possession, he's dribbling and makes Luke Cornett do an entire circle and then buckets a three from the corner. Bro, that shit was crazy, Roy. Really. Pat Bev was on one last night. Oh, that's it's awesome watching Patrick Beverly play with confidence. Yes. Yep. Christopher knows the 5 0 run I'm talking about. And then nice. fourth quarter, Chris Middleton heated up, kind of took over. He was three for three. One for one from the three point line with two assists in the fourth quarter. Uh, Pat B is definitely a vibe. This is absolutely 1000% correct. Yes. Um, one other thing that I have in the Bucks and the Celtics series is that the home team won every game. So uh, I got here I have, I have a whole list of stats. I got a little stat for you before you get going here. The Bucks won their, their home games against the Celtics by an average of 65. Like they were plus, well, not average by a plus sixty-five, and they lost on the road by minus three. So, hmm. take that for what you will. Interesting. <laughs> James brought up the Luke Cornett is the funniest big man I've ever seen. The way he can test three pointers in the paint. Yeah, he does. <sighs> yeah, that's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Okay, so this comes from Crazy Stats. You can find them on Facebook. I think they have Instagram too. But here are all of the the free throw stats. Here you go, Christopher. This is free. (laughs) Stats. (laughs) Giannis shot the only two free throws of the games as the Bucs combined for a record low two free throw attempts in a game. The Celtics became the first team in NBA history to not shoot a free throw in a game. The 2014 Grizzlies and 2018 Hawks shared the previous record of one. Mm -hmm. Additionally, the Bucs committed just four fouls on Tuesday, the fewest in league history. Plus, the two combined free throw attempts shattered the previous record of 11, set on November 10th, 2019, when the Pacers shot five and the Magic had six. So, shout out to Crazy Stats for the Crazy Stats. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty crazy stats. Yeah, I took a, so I took a, a lame uh, Snapchat video of Giannis at the free throw line because uh, that's what you know lame old white people do is they take uh, lame Snapchats. And I took one of the second free throw, and I was like, of course, I would record the miss. You know, like, of course. You know, I couldn't record the one that he made the first one, right? And little did I know that was going to be the last free throw of the game. Holy shit. (laughs) That's insane, dude. I couldn't believe that. And honestly, like you were saying, man, the game felt smooth. It did. You know what? There was bumping going on on both sides. Yep. There's going to be some grabbing. And at the end of the day, we've talked about it all year. These are the two giants. And for all the people, and I've seen you comment this, so I'm going to steal a little bit of what you said. For all the people that complain about the ref shows, and now we have a game where they let the teams decide the outcome, which is legitimately what should happen. Now, I understand what I calling, want. It's calling some, you know, some bumps here and there. I get that. But they were letting both teams get away with murder. It wasn't just the Bucks. Both teams were grabbing and bumping and slapping. And you know what? They missed more than we missed. We win. That's how it goes, yeah. baby. The Bucks were plus one from the free throw line. Plus one. Plus one. Like the, the fact that it wasn't like the Bucks shot 12 free throws and the Celtics shot zero. The fact yeah. that it was two to zero. I don't want to hear shit about refs. 
I agree. That's seriously outside of having the exact same number of free throws, one team having two, the other team having zero. It makes it about the players, which is what I would rather see. And Brolin, think about it. Dame's a guy that can shoot 10 free throws easily a game. Mm -hmm. Tatum Brown is like 11 or 12, to be honest with you. Tatum Brown, those are two guys that can shoot 10 free throws easily. Giannis can shoot 10 free throws easily. That right there is 40 free throws. Yep. Easily 40 free throws if you go by averages. Then you add in guys like, you know, Drew Holiday and Chris Middleton. And, you know, you just go down the list of both teams. This could have been a free throw contest. I love that it wasn't. Yep. Let them fucking play. If they make their threes, great. They should win. If we make our threes and we grab the defensive rebounds, which is what we did, whoop that ass on the on the offensive and defensive glass, by the way. So shout out to the Bucks for bringing the physicality. We win. That's how it goes. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. Yep. Okay. So the Bucks play tonight against the Magic. They play Friday (laughs) at OKC and they play Sunday at Orlando. Yep. It has been announced that Giannis is not going to play for the rest of the regular season. Fine. So they are just going to hold him out for the playoffs. Fine. Again, really doesn't matter. The Bucs have not lost any ground in the seeding, so I am not worried about it. Rest him for the playoffs. Have him ready to go. Um, Christopher said Pat B having 10 rebounds shows how we dominated. Yep. He's a dog. He's an absolute dog. Yeah. Okay. What else... Andrew Gozer said, Woj Bomb says Giannis is okay. Yep. Yeah. He yeah. Okay. It's, it's all about pain tolerance and how his muscle will react to the treatment. So, yep. you know, playoffs start in what, like, was it 12 days or 11 days? 12 days? Something like that. And the Bucks will have a little bit extra because they're because the top two seed, seed. So they play a play in team. So yeah. I think I'm, I'm sure Giannis will be ready for game one. Yeah. And depending on who the opponent is, you might even be able to let him rest game one, to be honest with you. Honest to God. If Giannis's leg is like, okay. He's 80%. I would, and this is going to sound crazy to some people, I would let him sit out game one. God forbid we win. I'm letting him sit out game two. Being so serious. How do you feel? How do you feel about letting him play, say, half of a game one or a game two? And if you were okay with it, would you play him for the first half or the second half? Like, would you play him for the first half to try to build a lead? and then let Chris and Dame take you home in the second half? Or would you see how the first half goes, and then if you need him, play him in the second half? I would definitely lean towards that second option because, let's be honest, Damian Damian Lillard freaking cooks without Giannis. He absolutely cooks. He he goes into alpha mode. (laughs) Here we go. We have our solution. (laughs) Andrew said, let the NASA's cook. So, oh God! That's Christopher totally said, good. "If Dame plays like playoff Dame, I like that. Take yeah, Giannis and, out one hundred percent. Dame cooks without Giannis. So in the first half, if Damian Lillard's on a heater, and you know Chris Middleton hasn't got it, got as many shots as you like, you know you're getting guys like Bobby Portis good looks, and they're just not falling. Malik Beasley's you know playing well. Like you got to play that chess game, right? So if you have Dame on fire, feeling good, and you still feel like Chris Middleton can make a big impact in the second half. You still have two stars there. I would still I would call Chris Middleton like a, a back end star, but I still think he's a star with his skill level and his IQ. Oh, yeah. And you know, with having two stars like that, if Dame is cooking, just let Giannis. Sit. He's a he's a guy that can fill up the stat sheet for you. Like he's not going to drop thirty or forty regularly. He's going to do it. It's going to happen. There's going to be four or five games. Like let's say the Bucks make it to the finals. You know, mm-hmm. there's going to be four or five games where he has thirty or forty. It's going to happen. But yeah. what he's going to give you consistently is 18, 7, and 6. Yeah. That's that's a star player. That's a dude filling up the stat sheet. Yeah. Not and just he's, scoring. And he's so, your legitimate third option. When everybody's, dude, he's, he's, he's a legitimate, legitimate second option. And I would say if you're looking at third options in the NBA, he's one of the best. Easily. Easily. Um, wow. Porzingis, I would say, is up there as well. Um. Christopher said he did cook the Suns. He absolutely cooked the Suns. He, he had a couple of games against the Nets that he cooked too. And him and Brooke Lopez carried the Bucks when Giannis Iper extended his knee. Bro, he he was he was white hot first of all. Oh, he went he went bonkers after Giannis got hurt. Bro, he I don't even remember what game that was exactly. So shame on me. I think it was but, game five. You're talking about the Hawks, bro. 
Yeah. When he went into the corner and hit like three straight threes, I was like, oh, hell no. He, like, he had like 38, I think, in game five. Hell no. Bro, he was going nuts. He had that one step back like deep in the corner. I was like, oh, it's over, bro. <laughs> he is he is taking their souls right now. That's pretty yep, close to what Christopher five. said. Christopher bro, said game he five, was, he was possessed. He was going so, fucking nuts. Chris, I just wanted to pull up Dame's playoff stats just to kind of level it out for anybody else who's wondering. Damian Lillard career playoffs averages 25.7 points, four and a half rebounds, 6.2 assists on 41.2% from the field, 37% from the three point line. So, pretty good numbers. So, I'll take that. Okay. What else do you want to say as far as the Bucks are concerned? Okay, hold on. Take a deep breath first so I don't have a heart attack. Keep the blood pressure down a little. <sighs> Do people know how to deal with adversity anymore, Tyler? That's not rhetorical. Like, I'm being. The, my thing, and I, I can tell you the way I handle it versus the way that I perceive it, mm -hmm. is you find out a lot about people by how they respond to it. That's fair. That's fair. And the way that I respond to it is sure. There might be, you know, brief moments of disappointment. I don't get angry anymore. Like I mm -hmm. used to have that where I'd get angry. Mm -hmm. I just have a couple times now where it's more disappointment. Like say for the Badgers basketball team, for example, mm -hmm. I wasn't angry that they lost, but I was just disappointed that the season was over. Yeah, I agree. And after that passes, which is pretty quickly, that, mm -hmm. that, that time that it takes for the disappointment to pass is continually shrinking as, as we continue to, to do our show the way that we do. And then after that, it becomes a little bit of trying to figure out like how and why. And then it's time to move forward. That's really how I handle it. So if you're at home and you didn't take notes... Go back to about 140, and uh, you'll hear a great way to, to process. So for me, God, this is so ridiculous. I feel like I'm talking to my son right now. <laughs> and my son is 11 years old, and he's got a lot of learning to do, man. And all 11-year-olds 11, all 11 had a lot of learning to do. I absolutely was one of the worst humans alive at 11 years old. 11-year-old Jake sucked ass. Because they didn't know me but, yet. Yeah, that's that's very true. I was very close to knowing you, but it's okay when things don't go your way, okay? Like, straight up, it's okay. And if you take the opportunity to look at ways to improve on why things aren't going your way, that's an even better way to process why things are not going your way. Instead of sitting there and, and cover your kids' ears if you're watching – Instead of sitting there and bitching and complaining about everything, because that's literally going to get you nowhere. It's probably maybe, gonna take you backwards, to be honest with you. Yeah, honest, it is. Maybe look at some stuff, look in the mirror, tell yourself, stop being an idiot, stop fucking up, do what you need to do, and get shit done. And that's what professional athletes do. They don't go and bitch and complain and complain on social media while well, the good normal ones don't. And you know what they do? They get back in the lab. Yeah. Giannis gets back in the lab when he misses free throws. And he goes and practices free throws. Giannis goes into the lab and he works on his post game. He works on his playmaking. He works on his basketball IQ and understanding when he's, he's messing up in that area. If Damian Lillard's missing a lot of threes, you know what he's going to go do? He's going to go practice. shoot a thousand threes. He's going to go practice some three point shots. You know what he's not going to do? He's not going to run to Facebook and Twitter and cry like a bitch. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going to mince words. I am so sick and tired of telling grown men to stop complaining. Are you shitting me right now? This is a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to enjoy this. It's supposed to be entertaining. Hence the word entertainment. I enjoy watching the Bucks. Mm -hmm. Do I like when they lose? Absolutely not. Of course not. I love winning. It's not the goal. What? I'm about to start a football season with my son again. The last wide football season that we're going to have starts on Saturday. And you know what? 
You know what I tell them all? We can have fun, guys. And that's the first thing that your parents are going to tell you. You're here to have fun, You're here to learn. But I set a goddamn standard. It's a lot more fun when you win. And that's the goddamn truth. That's so the goal. You, can go, you can go out here and have some fun. You can go mess around if you want. But not everybody's going to have fun. Not everybody wants to mess around. Winning is fun. Okay. Now, when you lose, it's okay. You got to look at some reasons why you lost. And you can deal with it in better ways than complaining on social media. And especially the way you guys are complaining. At least know what you're talking about if you're going to bitch. That's all I'm going to say. So, Andrew said the average Wisconsin fan after a bad season gets blackout drunk on spotted cow, bloody Marys, and old fashions. I mean, that's just a normal Friday night, to be honest with you. Yo, shut <laughs> up. We don't drink, bro. We, we don't. Drinkers. <laughs> We're, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be blatant about it. You and I are not average Wisconsin sports fans. No, we're not. And I would say this as well for people who follow us. They're not average Wisconsin sports fans either. And I'm not going to say, you know, we're better than anybody. But I think we're going about better ways of handling things. Great. And I, I don't feel, you know, ashamed to say that. Or I don't feel bad for people who do the opposite. Your negativity is not helping anything. And to to Jake's point on this is not only when you go to social media to complain about things, not only is that potentially damaging your own mental health by just feeding into that negativity, everybody else who sees that, they lose a percentage point on their positivity for the day by having to see your shitty attitude. Mm -hmm. So not only are you affecting yourself, Everybody who sees your post about, oh, my God, the season is over. Oh, my God, this team doesn't even deserve to be in the play-in. Oh, my God, this team's a first-round exit. When the playoffs haven't even started yet, all you're doing is wasting people's time and hurting their energy with your negativity. You might not think that you possess any sort of influence like that in the grand scheme of things, but let me tell you, if there are 10 people who think that exact same way, and if 10 people are taking one percentage of people's emotional batteries, that that's 10% gone just from scrolling on Facebook for a minute. That that amount of negativity can take 10% out of somebody's emotional bandwidth by scrolling through a social media for a minute. Think about that. That is why the, the positivity, the optimism, the, the level-headedness is so important to Jake and I. Because those things happen so rapidly and those voices are louder. And here's the thing. We've had this post and I made a post after the Bucks lost to the Raptors. Or no, it was after the Grizzlies loss. Mm -hmm. Christopher said I feel attacked. I'm just I mean, you're here, so you're, you're farther along than some people are. That's good that you feel attacked. Now use this constructively. Um, is that... I made a post, a pretty lengthy post after the Bucs had lost two in a row that people were freaking out already that they lost to two bad teams, mm -hmm. that somebody came after the Bucs lost to the Raptors and they're like, oh, you still feel this way? Yep. Came back. Somebody came back after they lost to the Knicks. Ooh, you still feel that way? Yep. It's not going to change because here's, you know, we are not going to change our, our stance, our mission, the way that we do our show, the way that we are carrying ourselves as people off of four regular season losses in an 82 game season. And you know, the the thing that people keep saying is oh there's no there's no defensive intensity, there's no heart, there's no will to win. And those are all feelings. The facts are throughout that losing streak, the Bucks were still the 2 seed. That's a fact, not a feeling. That is a fact. So the way that people can affect others is a big thing. One of the other big things that I dealt with over these last four games dealing with people on social media is something that we've discussed many, many times on this show, and that is people, instead of just owning the fact that they're negative and being like, you know what, you're right, I'm overreacting, or you know what, like there is a different way to look at it, 
pulling the phrase, quote, I have a right to criticize. I fucking hate that phrase. Yeah. And it's it's bullshit because it's just a it's a facade that people will put up to avoid acknowledging the fact that they're being negative. Yep. So is oh, the truth hurts or I'm just being realistic. No you're not. You are being negative and you're telling yourself that you're being realistic or that you're telling the truth to make yourself feel better about being a pessimist. Because like I said, the fact remains that the Bucks never fell out of the two seed during that four-game losing streak. Mm-hmm. Their seed didn't change that entire time. That is a fact. You're telling the truth that the Bucks don't deserve to be in a play-in. That's your feeling, and it's a stupid thing to say because they're literally still the two seed. Bro, did you – have you got – I've just got to ask. Did any of these people watch any of the other teams in the NBA for 82 games? 100% no. 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 So I looked at some box scores here and there. So your facts of, oh, this team is better than this team or this team doesn't deserve to be in the play-in is fucking shit. It's shit. Because if you were a Bulls fan, which I have a couple of Facebook friends who are Bulls fans who I talk to pretty regularly, and they hate everything that's going on with the Bulls. They laugh at the Bulls. They say that this team has talent and they have potential, but they don't put it all together. Do you really think the Bulls, who are not a playing team, are they a playing team? I don't think they're a playing team. They are a playing team. Do you think that the Bulls are better than the Bucks? Absolutely not. There's people that would say, well, they have been over the last week. Oh, wow. Okay. So your weak scenario between (laughs) from here to here, right? When the Bucks are playing bad, that's what you're going to choose. Well, let me go back and choose uh, one in February then, if that's if that's the game we're going to play. Yeah. So Christopher said, I mean, the Cavs went from three to five, losing one game, and the Bucks are still second, shows they're a top tier team. And I said that, Christopher, you're in the chat that I said this in, is that there was a bigger a bigger gap between two and three than there was between three and five. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the Bucks haven't changed that. Um, the Magic, the Knicks, and the Cavs are those three other teams between three and five, mm-hmm. which is crazy. That is, it is. It's, it's cool. Honestly, it's parity for the league, which is a good thing. It's mm-hmm. Obviously, it's the NFL. It's good for the NBA. It's never going to happen in Major League Baseball, which is annoying as hell, but it is what it is. But parity is good. It gives everybody pretty equal ground to stand on to try to have a chance at a title. Yeah. Now, <sighs> I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, what was the last thing you said? Sorry, uh, my fault. Um, talked about the the playing. You were you were hammering on uh, people uh, saying the Bucks aren't a playing team. Okay, well the the realistic versus pessimistic thing is what it is. Um, you already made the point on does it make losing less frustrating? Obviously, the answer is no. The goal is to win. That's obviously the goal. Mm-hmm. Now there's there's context. To, to acknowledge, obviously, which is what we did in the, the longer post that I made. And players missing is obviously a big part of context, which when we get to the playoffs, this team is set up to have everybody available for the playoffs. My thing is, is there is a much different perspective versus the way that we are doing things versus people after a four-game losing streak during the regular season – to go back and signing the team's death warrant and post dating it to January 29th. Hmm. I wanted to let that marinate for a second. That it, the fact that people are already writing the team off when the playoffs have literally not even started yet. There are still three more regular season games to go before we get to the playoffs that we've had this discussion a ton of times too that people are going to set themselves up so that they can be quote unquote, not setting themselves up for disappointment or not trying to get their hopes up instead of just actually just living in a positive and optimistic space Mm -hmm. for the longer haul. 
and then potentially having to face disappointment, which, like I said, with the Badgers is an example. I'm not disappointed that the team, you know, did whatever. I'm disappointed that the season is over because I want to watch more. The fact that you would then try to set yourself up hoping that the Bucks win a championship to save your shitty attitude is a horrible way to go through life. The season started at the end of October, and we are now at the beginning of April. We're talking six months that you will go to be negative after every loss and even sometimes after wins to try to not set yourself up for disappointment in the playoffs for a playoffs that even if they go to the finals will last two months, one third of the time and try to flip that around. Like I, I can't understand why people want to live like that. I, I'm going to, I'm going to call my buddy Alex real quick, but we're on the way down to Milwaukee and I'm talking to him about the game and I'm like, I'm, I fully expect this. You know, I gave my points, you know, I liked what I heard after the next game. Uh, from Giannis and Dame, and, you know, I fully expect us to get a win. And he goes, I'm going in not expecting anything, so I'm not disappointed. I'm like, bro, what the fuck? Like, like straight up, that's what I said. I'm like, do you, like, like, how do you go through life? How, why, why do you, you don't – people don't correlate how they think about sports to daily life, but, like, if you have that mindset about this, you're going to have that, that, in my opinion, weak mindset – in your daily life, and that's trash. You're not helping yourself. Yeah, you're, not, you're honestly not, actively hurting yourself. To yeah, be you're honest, not making yourself be a winner. You're not training your mind the right way. Like, there's ways to go about shit, and it's just yeah, it's bad. Um, Andrew said I'm optimistic as a fan. If I was a better, I'm not sure I'd be optimistic. Bucks for sure are a contender, but I can't say they're a favorite. And that's the thing; they don't. They're not. A, they're not a favorite. You know, I, that's the thing. I'd rather just contender is fine. But here's the thing. 29 out of 30 teams aren't winning the championship. That is true. How about That's... this? Think about this. How many teams have won the championship in the last 20 years? Think 20 years. So since 2004, I don't know, 10. Well, you got the Bucks, right? Yeah. You got the Warriors. You got yeah. the Heat. Yeah. The Raptors. Yeah. Did you years. say Nuggets yet? Nope, Nuggets. So that's five. Yep. Spurs. Spurs. So that's six. Yep. Cavs. So seven. Cavs. Seven. Okay. Lakers. So seven. Celtics. Is nine. Lakers, Celtics, so that's nine. I think that's it. So think in the last twenty years, in the last twenty years, not even one third of the NBA franchise have won a ring. And 29 out of 30 won't win it this year. It doesn't get much better when you go to 30 years, by the way, because you just add, like, the Rockets, the Bulls. So that's 11. I think that's it. Rockets and Bulls. Because yep. you had the, the, the Lakers. Lakers three Peat was in there. Lakers, the Spurs. So going back to 94. Yeah, and the Bulls you, three Peat. Yeah, you really the Spurs just had a couple more in there, and the Rockets went back to back, I think. Yeah, ninety. Yeah, so you eleven teams in the last thirty years. <laughs> in the last thirty so how years, long yeah. been alive basically. Eleven yeah. teams, so that's barely over a third. Yeah, so if you go, that's one year per team. Thirty years, thirty teams. There you go. Uh, Andrew said technically the Lakers got an in-season tourney championship. Yeah, they got a little trophy for that, so good for them. Um, I don't know if that was said, a cold job, but if it was, that was great. That was good. That was real good. There's two this year. No, I'm not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing no. that. No. The, the extra cash is nice, but it's not a ring. Um, Christopher said, to, to be honest, to be the second seed with a coach swap and adding Dame is amazing. If they don't win it all this year, they have many more. And that's the thing. Like They have their core for at least three years. Um, But if the Bucks make the Eastern Conference Finals, then that's it. Like I'm fine with that. Yeah. I'm fine with it if they get to the Eastern Conference Finals. And it ends there. Um, my last thing that I want to say as far as, you know, negativity versus positivity is concerned is the other thing with it. And like I mentioned with, you know, the amount of negativity that there is that people can see is that the other thing with positivity is it's harder. Mm -hmm. It's easy to be negative. It's super easy. Mm -hmm. And other people around you will do it too. 
And that's something that people say is, oh, well, other people are saying it, so it's got to be true. It's the It goes back to the thing where when you were a kid and your mom would ask you, oh, if your friends were going to jump off a bridge, would you do it too? People are hypothetically jumping off of bridges with no water below them on social media. I'm are you going to be doing the same thing? Push. Just going to be honest. That's that's how that's how that translates. Being positive is harder, especially after losses. And here's the thing, and this this is where I was wanting to tie back to it was with the people asking, "Oh, after the third loss, are you still positive? Ooh, after the fourth loss, are you still positive?" Yes, and we will continue to be so, regardless of what happens in the playoffs. We will continue to be so because this is the thing, and I can end on this. I can end the show on this is that it's easy to be positive when things are going well. It's easy to be negative when things aren't going well. Yes, sir. But here's the thing. It's hard to be positive when things aren't going well, and that's the work that we are doing. So, yeah, obviously we're going to be positive when things are going well. It's super easy to do. Oh, the Bucks are rolling along. The Brewers are 7-3. and three. It's easy to be positive because things are going well. But what's going to set us as Wisco fanatics and people that follow us and comment on our show and follow our pages and things like that is it is harder when things are not going well to maintain that resolve. And Jake and I will continue to do that regardless of how bad things get. Amen, buddy. 